Hello, hello, everybody. Great to see you. And uh, yeah, really happy to be back again and uh, really excited. So many people are tuning in. So uh, yeah, welcome. Hope you guys have been enjoying the, the sessions so far. I've been super ins insightful. I've been checking out a couple of them earlier today as well. But uh, now we're going to be diving in uh, to the mysterious world of game recruiting. And uh, maybe I could shortly introduce myself before we start with busting some myths. So as mentioned, uh, my my name is Tholi, and uh, I'm a Senior Employee Experience Manager at Savage Game Studios. Uh, we were actually uh, acquired by uh, PlayStation about a year ago as well, so we're a part of PlayStation Studios. And uh, I myself have been in the games industry for over 10 years, uh, both in startups and also large multinational organizations, and uh, I'm actually fairly new at Savage. Uh, so I've been in the company for about a, uh, about a month and a half, which is quite exciting. And uh, during my career, I've also been involved a lot in games recruiting. So uh, yeah, I've uh, done a lot of different things. Uh, on that side as well. So I thought that it would be interesting to sort of bust some myths uh, today and uh, sort of see what kind of uh, notions do people have about games recruiting. And maybe you'll also learn something uh, that might be useful for you as a candidate as well from, from the sessions. So yeah, but let's get right through it. Uh, so first, um, I wanted to kind of like uh, open up a little bit about games recruiting in general, like what's the sort of like general feeling that people get when we talk about games recruiting and I feel like this is how most people sort of think about it uh, so usually games recruiting seems to be kind of like this black hole almost you kind of send your CV somewhere and then it disappears into the ether and you never hear back and um, then the dragon here kind of like represents the fact that you know some people find specifically recruiting in the games industry to be a bit like intimidating even a little bit scary. Uh, some of the interview processes can be like super heavy and uh, yeah. Um, and it can also feel like only the best survive from, from this bunch and um, it can be sort of seen as really competitive as well from a candidate perspective. So this is usually like the kind of notion that that uh, that people have, at least from from what I've talked with with different candidates, and also from uh, with people from different industries as well. So they kind of see uh, games recruiting almost kind of as a different animal compared to a lot of other uh, other industries as well. So yeah, but um, yeah, let's get right to it. So I have four myths uh, to share with you today, and I'm sure there will be more uh, in the Q and A. The first myth I'd like to share with you uh, is that open positions can only be found on job sites. Now, uh, I think this was also touched upon a little bit earlier in some other sessions today, but from my personal experience uh, and from a lot of other per, uh, people's experiences as well, this is completely false. So, for example, even for me, two out of the three roles I've been in the games industry in were never actually advertised openly so um they were only like being uh, being sort of advertised only in sort of inside networks or you know some person talked with someone who talked with someone who found out that i was maybe looking for a job and then i got hired through that way so um yeah, this is something to to think about specifically for people who are currently on the job hunt, that not all positions are necessarily sort of advertised openly. And a lot of the positions can sort of be um, be sort of searched searched on the down low, I would say. And um, obviously this makes it hard for candidates because you know you need to be kind of at the right place at the right time. And you don't necessarily know when that right time and that right place where it is because of the fact that all of the roles are not really like uh, super openly advertised either. I would say that most are, but a lot of them aren't either. So um, then I'd also like to pose a question to all of you that, you know, would your network recommend you to a job? Uh, because for me, it ended up being that I got 
like basically like all of the three roles that I've been in uh, through recommendations from my network. So uh, I think that's a huge testament to the fact that, you know, the games industry, it is small, people know each other. So it's really important to kind of like create that robust network for yourself in order to kind of like have those connections. And, you know, I know network is kind of like this curse word that <laughs> people feel is like, ugh, you know, do I have to and do I have to like, you know, do this networking and like events and stuff like that. But at least in my case, um, literally, it's helped me to get all of the jobs that I've had in the industry. So it is really, really important. Now, uh, the second myth that I'd like to also bust is that uh, sometimes there's this notion that recruitment processes take too long because of no good reason. Now, basically, if you look at an example of a recruitment process, usually, so this is kind of like from a candidate's perspective, you apply to a job, you go through some interviews, maybe some test assignments, and then the contract's signed. And, you know, it's kind of like this, it should be a quick, like, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am process in a way, you know. Both parties know what they want, both parties know what they're looking for, and it should be a done deal, right? Well, it's not really like that. Now, I want to show you kind of like what the recruitment process actually looks like from a game recruiter's perspective or the hiring team's perspective. And it looks something a little like this. So first, obviously, you have to do a lot of preparations. There's like defining the actual role, figuring out the compensation budget for the role, you know, figuring out the description, um, you know, posting the job in a lot of places, managing the applicant tracking system, you know, recruitment partner briefing if you're working with like consultants to uh, to help you with sourcing and stuff like that, and then the actual sourcing. So you know, you might be doing headhunting, you might be, uh, you know, getting references, also uh, getting internal candidates for the job. So sometimes actually people end up applying internally uh, for the open jobs inside uh, of the company. And uh, then you're doing the screening, so you're reviewing all the resumes, maybe doing some phone screens, um, you know, maybe even doing some shorter, uh, shorter interviews and, and such. And then um, you go to selecting, so you do test assignments, you do interviews, you make sure that you know you're getting all of the feedback, and everyone in the hiring team knows what they're doing, and everyone has sort of like you know a general uh, a general idea of you know what candidates are the best, and and so on. And then you go into actually like the hiring part, which is you know negotiating the job offers and doing reference calls and all of these things. And then after that, obviously going into the pre-boarding and onboarding as well once the hiring is done. And throughout all of this, you need to keep your applicant tracking system up to date. You need to keep your partners informed, give all the candidates feedback, answer candidate questions, and you know participate in recruitment events, for example, like this. And oh, uh, one more thing. Oftentimes, especially in smaller companies, there might not even be a recruiter per se in the team. Uh, and this means that a lot of, for example, hiring managers, they're also acting as recruiters. So a lot of the times they're having to juggle recruiting and actually making games at the same time. And that is super, super, super challenging. So this is kind of why sometimes uh, the processes may seem like it takes like unnecessarily long, but there's a lot of stuff to do during it. And basically, one thing that I also want to mention to people that hiring is always a risk for a company. It does take time and effort to really make sure that you are finding the right people, not just in terms of like the company, but the people themselves who are getting hired, they also need to be sure that is this the right place for me. And obviously, you know, mishires happen in every company, uh, but it is something that, you know, companies take time and put in effort to make sure that that risk is as low as possible. And then also simple things can delay the process. Maybe the hiring manager is on sick leave on one day when they're supposed to be an interview. Then, you know, one of the interviews has to be moved forward a week in the calendar. But then, you know, that might be pushing some other interviews forward in the calendar as well, which obviously 
prolongs the process even more. So even sometimes these kind of simple things can really uh, delay the process in some cases. And then, as mentioned, you know, some companies lack the know-how and resources. So, for example, for a lot of smaller companies, they might not have a recruiter, but actually the leads or the hiring managers, they're the ones doing the whole process. So, obviously, it's a lot to do. And um, then also, one thing that uh, I, I wanted to mention, uh, mention as well that no process or no recruitment process should be unnecessarily long or not fit for purpose either. So there is this kind of balance that needs to be struck in terms of like being able to find out the amount of information that you need to in order to make an informed decision as a company to hire someone, but at the same time, not overburden the candidates or not draw the process out too long. So yeah, but it's always kind of like that, finding that balance is is really, really important. But just so you guys know, uh, this is kind of like the reason for why some processes tend to seem like they're like unnecessarily long, but like I mentioned, there's a lot going on in the background. And then um, a little bit of a quickie. So uh, with Myth 3, um, I get this quite a lot for some reason that hiring decisions are made by the recruiter. And I don't know why this is, um, but uh, let me show you kind of like some examples of some of the hiring decisions that need to be made uh, during the hiring process. So there's a lot of different ones. So, you know, what are the roles and the skills that we're looking for? Um, what's our budget? Um, you know, how, are, how much are we able to pay this person? Um, how do we, who do we choose for interviews? Who did the best dream test assignments? You know, how, what do we offer uh, the candidates? And are we able to, you know, increase our offer or not. So there's a lot of different decisions that go into the recruitment process. But what I can say that what's the role of an actual recruiter during the process is that recruiters are facilitators. So they do wield a lot of power and influence during the process. So for example, the recruiters usually do pre-screenings, for example, uh, for the process. So usually uh, the pre-screening uh, candidates who move on to the next phase are usually chosen by the recruiter or at least uh, like there's quite a bit of influence that the recruiters have in terms of like actually choosing uh, choosing candidates to to move forward in the process. And then also I've seen uh, cases where a recruiter has, for example, raised certain red flags to the hiring team that, hey, you know, uh, do you understand that there is a risk like this if we do end up hiring this person? And that can sometimes uh, be a make or break situation, but ultimately, usually the hiring manager is always the one who calls kind of like the final shot in a way. Uh, so this is kind of both true and false. Um, the recruiters are the facilitators who do have a lot of power, but the final shots are usually uh, called by the hiring managers. Now, uh, the next one, this is one of the most interesting ones uh, that I encounter quite a lot. So I don't get feedback because companies just don't care about candidates. Like I don't matter, I'm just cogging the wheel and no one wants to give me feedback uh, because they just don't care. Now, um, there is kind of a truth to that in some cases, which is hard to uh, hard to say, but obviously there are companies that feel like their resources are best put into use when they nurture the candidates who have the best possibility to actually get hired. But at the same time, that's not a sustainable way to do things because ultimately, for example, I've been in cases where uh, a company has ended up actually rejecting someone, but a few years later, that person ends up getting hired into the same company for a different role, for example. So that's why uh, being able to really kind of nurture a long-term uh, candidate 
experience and candidate relationships would be super, super important for all companies. But at the same time, um, what I can tell you is that giving individualized feedback to absolutely every candidate is completely unrealistic. For example, I've been in recruitments where there have been, I don't know, 400, 500 candidates even uh, for one single recruitment. Now, imagine me sitting there and writing individualized feedback to all of these candidates. Now, obviously, there are certain things that, you know, can be enabled by automation. You know, we have chat GPT and all of these kind of things uh, coming up, especially into the recruiting field as well. So maybe in the future, this could be something that could be used to give more individualized feedback to more candidates than we can at the moment. Uh, but it's still in a very sort of early stage, I would say, at this point. But I, at the same time, I would say that um, at least in most companies where I've been, the people who get into uh, the interview phase, they are usually given uh, given individualized feedback, even if they get rejected after the first interview. But this obviously depends on the company. And uh, then also a good recruitment process should enable candidates to learn about themselves. So the feedback that you get from uh, the recruitment process in the best way possible, like it can actually help you to learn something about yourself and actually be a better candidate in the next process that you go through. And this is regardless of whether you get rejected or actually get hired uh, into the company. And then I'd like to also pose a thought to you. How easy is it for you personally to give negative feedback to someone. It's not easy, isn't it? So basically, I sometimes encounter this as well, that if there's negative feedback to give, it can sometimes feel easier to not give it at all. And this sometimes happens also in recruitment situations. And the best recruiters usually do also end up giving the negative feedback as well. Obviously, you know, they package it up in a way where it's, you know, not not completely sort of like crazy or anything like that. But at the same time, they want to make sure that the candidates are able to understand the reasons behind the decisions that the company is making. But there are also situations that I've seen where recruiters and companies feel like, uh, it's not worth our time to spend the time on giving negative feedback when we can nurture the candidates who we feel have the best possibility to actually get into the company in the future. So they end up putting their resources into nurturing the, the most potential candidates that they see uh, in the pipeline. It's not a great, great situation, but it does happen at the same time. Now, then a couple of uh, like final thoughts before we go into the Q&A section. So um, I'd like to also challenge everyone's thinking here a little bit. As I mentioned, in the best recruitment processes, usually candidates end up learning something about themselves and they end up being better candidates as a result in the future. And a way for you to actually have an open mind is to kind of ask yourself a couple of questions during a recruitment process and actually really thinking about the feedback that you have received throughout the process. One of the things that I always encourage people to do is that, did you read between the lines? There are a lot of things that you can sense from, for example, like body language of people when they're interviewing you uh, or something that they've said um, said in an interview that isn't necessarily a question or direct feedback to you. So those are usually points where you can learn quite a bit about the company and be able to kind of like identify certain things uh, that might be able to kind of open up a little bit more to you, like, how do I fare as a candidate in this situation? And also, do you reflect or only listen to external feedback? and dismiss it if it doesn't validate your feelings. Obviously, receiving negative feedback or feedback that kind of like, you know, uh, sort of like it's different to how we feel about each other can sometimes be super jarring. And our first reaction as humans is to always be like, no, no, I'm not like that. What are you talking about? But I also encourage people to sometimes step back 
and really think about, hmm, why does this person think that way? And is there truth to that? Or is there a miscommunication, for example? Or is it something else? So really kind of like having that open mind to really think that, are you able to learn something about yourself that you hadn't realized before? And then also, can you put yourself in the hiring team's shoes? What do you think they are looking for? Did you actually correspond with what they're looking for? Um, you know, is, uh, is something that you said during the interview process, for example, something that they went like, hmm, I don't know, or what was positive uh, to, to the hiring team? What, what are the things that were positive from, from your side that they saw? And basically, these kind of introspective questions can help you to really better understand your skills and your abilities, but also yourself as a person as well, and really help you to kind of think about how do you communicate in the future, for example, in interview situations, uh, or how do you, for example, you know, formulate your CV or, or something else uh, in the future to have a better chance in the next recruitment. And then also, if there are any um, hiring teams uh, or people who have been in hiring teams or even recruiters uh, on, on site, uh, I would uh, like to also pose a couple of questions to you. So there's always a reason uh, behind a gut feeling. So we often hear this kind of fact that mm, we're not going to move forward with this candidate because I just have a gut feeling that they're not the right fit for the team. But as hiring teams, the reason like why uh, you make decisions is super important to understand uh, because that leads you to make better informed decisions. What's behind that gut feeling? What made you feel that way? Is that feeling true? Is it based on fact or is it just based off of something else that you can't really grasp? So that's super, super important. And then also, are you providing a good candidate experience to everyone, not only the people that you end up hiring? Because as I mentioned, a lot of the times I've seen situations, I was just talking with one of our uh, one of our team members, I actually met him uh, many, many years ago at a recruitment event, and he ended up uh, like uh, applying to the company, but he didn't get in. But now I see him in the games industry and he got in eventually and I was super, super happy to to see him like, you know, flourish in his career. So there are these situations where someone might end up applying multiple times, but what if they have a really bad experience the first time and don't end up applying at all after that and then end up going to another company and really flourishing there? It's a good question to, to ask and really kind of think about from, a, from the hiring team's perspective that you should nurture every candidate regardless of whether they have potential now or in the future. Now, this, uh, this was kind of like a wrap up to, to my thoughts uh, at this point. So I wanted to also leave plenty of time for, uh, for questions as well. And uh, oh, wow, there is a lot already in chat. Thank you so much. So we'll go to the questions right now. Uh, Vadim asks, what's the best way to find these hidden positions? Open applications, ask people from companies about open positions every few months. So um, a lot of the times uh, I've seen these kind of hidden positions being filled by uh, sending open applications or, for example, you know, if someone has met someone at a recruitment event, for example, and started talking about, hey, you know, I'm doing this and that. And then, you know, the company might be saying that, hey, uh, you know, we're actually kind of on the down low, maybe looking for a similar person like you. So maybe we should talk more. So it really is hard to kind of like identify what's the best way to do this, because I also don't want you guys to harass recruiters by sending them messages every single month to kind of ask like, hey, what are the open positions that you have right now? Uh, because that might not also be necessarily the best way to, to get in either. So it's really about sort of like, again, figuring out, you know, are there cer certain like, um, you know, quiet messages in your network that, hey, you know, there might be this company who is hiring for, for tech positions at the moment or in a couple of months time or, or something else. Uh, or then, for example, with the, with the open applications. So, yeah. 
And uh, then um, Luckman uh, asks, is it true that rejection, rejections at the screening phase means there's something critically wrong with the application? So that's a really good question. Not necessarily. Uh, it might just be that there are people who are more qualified for, for the position who have applied. And this is usually the case, especially with, um, uh, with positions that have a lot of applications coming in, because usually there's a lot of competition as well for, for those those applications. But at times, it can also mean that, you know, you just do not have the specific qualifications that the company is looking for. But I would say that most often it's it's these two, uh, these two things. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's something critically wrong. It's just that you don't necessarily have the needed qualifications or there are better candidates in the pipeline at the moment. Uh, Verdiana asks, how to build a solid network as a junior? That's a really good question. So really, uh, I highly, highly recommend, you know, joining game jams, uh, being able to work on like community projects. I, for example, volunteered uh, for, for a couple of years uh, in, um, in one of the games industry, like associations here in Finland, before I actually got a job in the industry. And that helped me to really kind of get to know more people in the industry and just to kind of like, you know, have a good time together and really get to know, uh, get to know a couple of people from the industry before I actually joined it myself. So uh, yeah, really being able to kind of like put your hands into as many, uh, as many things as you can to really get to know, uh, know a lot of people because game development, ultimately, it's teamwork. So the more people you know, the easier it will be. And the more people you're able to really kind of showcase your skills to. And showcase that you're a good team player. Uh, I think that's always, uh, always a hugely positive thing. Work from ground zero. So kind of similar to what I said, I said previously as well. So really like going to game jams, um, being brave and, you know, going to different events, even if you don't know anyone. Uh, I, for example, literally when I started my volunteer work in the games industry, I literally walked in. Talk to, uh, to, you know, find out how can I get like, a, 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 get a, a, get a volunteer job uh, in uh, the industry. So, yeah. And then uh, how can people in QA showcase their skills and how can individuals outside the EU prove themselves as ideal candidates for relocation, even with junior experience? So uh, even for relocation, I would say that it's really just like similar to, to normal positions as well. But I feel like specifically with relocation, uh, you do have to kind of like really be able to showcase that um, you want to stay in the long run and uh, that you're kind of reliable in the sense that you aren't going to move into, for example, another company uh, within uh, within like a few a few months or, or something else. So I think like that's a, that's a huge, huge thing for relocations. And then also uh, for QA, uh, how to showcase your skills. So I think like the more, more sort of practical experience you have, for example, even from like hobby projects, honestly, I think that's always, uh, always a really great thing to, to showcase in your portfolio. And even, you know, working, for example, on projects with friends uh, is, a, is a really, really great, uh, great thing to do. And uh, then Maxim asks, uh, I'm interested in people and culture with an emphasis on well-being and workability. How should I approach games industry companies for these types of roles? Should I bring my love of video games or would that be distracting from the recruiter's point of view? So uh, kind of from a similar vein as I was. So uh, what I actually ended up doing when I joined the industry uh, was that uh, I ended up actually making a uh, portfolio for myself uh, of the stuff that I had for example, done in school, uh, just to kind of showcase practically what I was able to actually do uh, in, uh, in the industry. 
so that's like one uh, one thing as well. Uh, I would say that uh, an interest in games is always really positive, uh, even if you would not necessarily sort of like uh, be uh, working in a game related position, but showcasing interest in games is always uh, a more positive thing rather than a distraction from uh, from a recruiter's point of view. So yeah. And um, uh, Morley, I'll be answering Morley. more questions. Yes, sorry. Yes. We're running out of time. There's a lot of <laughs> yeah. like, great questions. Yeah, I was just about, yeah, I, I'm going to be answering uh, more of the questions in chat uh, right after the session. So I'll be sticking around there. Uh, I just wanted to quickly also shout out uh, that Savage is also hiring for multiple different roles. So uh, you can apply at savagegamestudios.com. And uh, yeah, uh, answering more questions in chat soon. And uh, have a great time, everyone. Thank you so much, Tully.